Um, all this meeting to order. The first action item would be a motion to approve conducting meeting by electric means. Anyone would like to make that motion? I move that the items on the meeting agenda constitute essential business of this board. Meeting electronics is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans considering the COVID-19 outbreak and any conflicting with the governor's executive order permitting electronic meetings to be Thank you. Is there a second for this? Second. Second. Um, all in favor, I have to do a roll call. Uh, I'll start with Ms. Franklin. Aye. Ms. Eppington. Aye. Mr. Frederick. Aye. Dr. Campbell. Aye. And Dr. Terry, Dr. Smith. Mr. Smith, I, I see you're logged in, but all right, well, I think I'll just say you're abstained from this vote. Um, Dr. Caldwell has joined us here as well for those of you who are paying attention. Yeah, no. So and he's logging in. Thank you. And Dr. Dr. Smith, can you um, hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Sorry, I'm late. So, okay. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is approval of the October 8 minutes. I, uh, those were um, sent around in our pre meeting package that anyone had a chance to review and or have any comments? Move to approve. Move to approve. Ms. Effington, is there a second? Second. second. All right, thank uh, Franklin. Um, voting, Ms. Franklin? Aye. Ms. Effington? Aye. Dr. Campbell? Aye. Frederick? Aye. And Dr. Smith? Aye. You guys keep rotating on my screen, so I apologize my order is all going in order. All right, thank you. So then that's approved. Um, Dr. Caldwell, um, we're going to you on the agenda to review the data sharing that, that we discussed last time. If you just want to update the group, and yes, thank you. Uh, as uh, we briefly provided uh, an update at the last board meeting, uh, I was pleased to let you know that the contractor for the um, approved uh, data sharing plan uh, has let us know that they're ready to move forward with the uh, approved data sharing policy uh, that was uh, approved by the Board of Health. Uh, since that time, uh, Mr. Uh, Durbin uh, from Metro IT uh, has met uh, with Dr. Campbell to review the progress uh, and subsequently we provided each board member with uh, information prior to this meeting, which we've uh, included also in your packet to uh, remind you of the policy that was approved by the board, uh, as well as to go through uh, what that uh, means specifically uh, in process, and also to remind you what the current interim data sharing policy is, which uh, the board approved because they wanted to do something uh, in between the final policy being done. So, so uh, we had determined, the board had determined that the interim data sharing policy was not as desirable as the final one. And uh, we have uh, wanted your uh, review at this meeting before we proceeded to uh, transfer over uh, planning for tomorrow. So. We do have uh, available uh, colleagues uh, who could answer any questions that I can. So I'm happy to, uh, to, to answer those questions. Any questions from anyone? I, I do have one question. Yes. And I'm looking at the Metro National Police Department flowchart. And in the middle of the page, um, when the when there's a query response, it returns a list of possible matches. Um, those are a list of possible matches of individuals that uh, are categorized as being positive for COVID, correct? Dr. Paul? Um, yeah, um, I, I names that could possibly be positive. For, um, I, could you maybe, um, let's see, I'm wondering if Keith, would you be able to know more details about how that query response works and how the names get provided? 
Uh, this is John Singleton with uh, Police IT. Um, as as far as the the list of possible matches, uh, what the query, what the you, uh, what the officer is uh, querying is uh, by name, and so the 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 list of possible matches or or any uh, any uh, names that are in the health department database of active. Uh, COVID cases that match the query that the officer uh, submitted. Okay, that's what, that's what I thought. And then my follow-up question is regarding privacy issues. I'm, and, and I don't know if there's anyone from Metro Police Department. How, how do we protect against privacy? So our police officers, do they have an obligation just to maintain the, the privacy of any other names that they might see in that query list. What what are what are the ethics around that? Yes, the uh, yes they do. I mean, we uh, every officer um, has the obligation to keep all uh, privacy or sensitive confidential information uh, uh, confidential. So the uh, by policy uh, and 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 those uh, by law. And so one of the things that that you may be interested we have we have drafted a roll call training um, uh, document that uh, that periodically goes out to uh, officers uh, at roll calls to uh, train them up on new happenings and and uh, new policy updates and things of that nature we have developed a um, uh, one will go out for this as well so uh, it will stipulate uh, exactly what the uh, board approved, and uh, it will reference uh, uh, the laws associated with that, uh, HIPAA and otherwise, uh, about safeguarding that information. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that explanation. Any other questions or thoughts? Just one quick one. Yes. I think it's obviously a yes answer, but... The date of when they were positive is on there, and and then how long will it remain on there? I think we've gone through this, and I'm sorry, I don't remember. Yeah, um, I, I, I will I'll uh, let you know that the the, the date uh, will. Uh, I, I don't know the date on the front. Keith, do you would you know this offhand? The, uh, as far as from a police standpoint, uh, what we see, we do get the test date or, uh, the, you know, the date, uh, what is referred to, uh, what we get on our side is something called a test date. So my assumption is that's at the date of the testing. And then uh, my assumption from the health department side, uh, there, uh, there is a, a time frame in which they, they from a, from the date that they tested, uh, their test date is until um, there's a day, uh, there's a time frame there. I believe it's 14 days, but after that time, we no longer get that uh, that query. Uh, and, yeah, I think if I remember right, I called them when somebody was defined uh, declared. Active, yeah, yeah, so, so we, 14 uh, days or death. That, that's yeah. right, uh, exactly. So um, as you know, on our portal, every day we give the number of cases as well as the currently active cases. So those people that are designated active would be on that list. And then once they drop off and not being active, they should not appear on this uh, active listing. Right. Um, any other questions? I'm looking at my colleagues on. I see Mr. Frederick, your hands up, please. Uh, yes. So, uh, will Dr. Campbell's group that oversaw the development of this uh, be the independent auditing body that we asked for, or is, did I, is that already specified in some other way? Yes. Yes. Uh, I uh, will work uh, with our, our team that uh, Dr. Campbell has put together with Dr. Campbell's approval to uh, review uh, how the implementation of this system is going and uh, can begin there. Any other questions? Just, I'd like just to make one comment is that we've got to have enough, uh, we've got to have some data to review. So that we need to be doing this for a while before we can really review it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So, so that, that's correct. And, and, uh, and Dr. Campbell, will you work with Dr. Paul to sure what that data time and stuff is, you know, trust. But I'll leave it in your hands to ensure the timing and the data that is there, that oversight that needs to happen in a timely fashion. Is that fair to say? That's fair. I'll take care of that. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Dr. Smith, we want to make sure you have the opportunity to have anything. Okay. Um, okay. No. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you, Dr. Alba. Talk. Yeah. Thank you. So we will be talking about fetal infant mortality review program update. Thank you so much for being here. Um, good to see you in person. Go off. Thank you. Sure. 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 Yeah, this is uh, uh, Trevor uh, Hobson, who runs our fetal infant mortality uh, review program, and we're really pleased to uh, be able to present this information to you today as an update. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell. So um, thank you, uh, Board of Health members, for having me today. Again, my name is Trevor Hobson, and I am the director for the Fetal Infant Mortality Review. The Fetal Infant Mortality Review is a program of population health, where Tina Lester is our bureau chief, and Diana Allen Robb is our maternal child and adolescent health director. Um, I am going to speak to you briefly and wanted to make sure that you had an organizational chart of where in the FEMA thing the FEMA team falls. I serve on the FEMA team along with three other people. I serve with Don Smith, who is here today. Don is our nurse abstractor and records coordinator. Also, Allison Butler, who is our parental interviewer and also coordinator for Carson. Stacy and Nicole Barr, who is our infant vitality coordinator. So when we talk about infant mortality, what we're talking about is the death of an infant for every 1,000 live births. And in Nashville and Tennessee, we're not doing a very good job. There's more work to be done. The United States average rate is 5.7 infant deaths per 1,000 live births. For Tennessee, it is 7.2. And for Davidson County, it is 7.1. These numbers are concerning for a couple of reasons. Um, the infant mortality rate really is a broad indicator of community health. And so if our infants are not healthy, our families are not healthy, and it really um, starts to affect the community. So as we look at that number for Davidson County and extrapolate by race, um, the numbers get to be even more challenging. In Davidson County, again, the infant mortality rate is 7.1. For white babies born in Davidson County, the infant mortality rate is 4.1. For Latina babies born in Davidson County, it is 6.1. And for black babies, it is 14.1. So in 2018, not per 1,000? Yes. Okay, sorry. That is correct. No, oh, that's fine. So in 2018, non-Hispanic black infants died at a rate that was 3.4 times higher than the rate for non-Hispanic white infants. So to put this in perspective, another way to look at this is we have three kindergarten classes of babies who don't reach their first birthday every year. So what do we do about this? We have a fetal infant mortality team, and we have a process that is our case review team and community action team. We do lots of other things. 
We do car seat safety, we do outreach, we do education. Of course, COVID-19 has curtailed that quite a bit. But among the things that we do, our case review team and our community action teams are our most important partners. Our case review or CRT team is made up of physicians, nurses, chaplains, community volunteers, folks from social service agencies, and others. And they receive an abstracted medical record from the birth hospital where the demise occurred. They review that summary and look for gaps in service with everything done that should have been done for this mother and infant. And also perceive inequity in treatment at the hospital that we may determine from the parental interview. So our case review team meets once per month. Our community action team is sort of the leg, um, the action side of our CRP. So our case review team, after looking at all of our cases, and we usually do about 60 per year, they will find trends or patterns and pass that information on to our community action team and the community action team has the task of coming up with short-term and long-term goals so that we might be successful in bringing these numbers down um, from the infant mortality rate. So the typical woman that we saw in 2018, the cause of her baby's death was a silver. She was 19 to 29 years of age. She was black. She had a high school diploma. She had thin hair and was single. So as we look at these things, one might tend to be depressed or discouraged. But what I'd like for you to know is that we have had some successes, and we're very excited about that. There was a campaign between the Metro Public Health Department and other community partners that ran from 2015 to 2018, and we were able to see a 42 percent decline in sleep-related infant deaths. That's huge, and it's huge because sleep-related infant deaths are something that it is preventable. It is preventable. So we were very excited about that. We partner oftentimes with community agencies like Alive Hospice. And one of the things that we did recently in 2019 was we had healthcare professionals who previously had come to us and said they really were uncomfortable having discussions with parents after they suffered a loss. And so we partnered with Alive Hospice to put on a workshop specifically for healthcare professionals to talk about what are some of the things to say to parents after they've had a fetal or infant demise. It was very successful. We had about 22 healthcare professionals, mostly nurses, um, but it's, it's usually the nurses that are the ones that are coming in and um, talking with the family. I also wanted to mention to you something that we did this year. COVID-19 has caused us to try to be creative about doing things. And we had a parade during Black Breastfeeding Awareness Week, and it was um, it was a lot of fun for the staff. We actually partnered with the Metro uh, National Fire Department. Dr. Caldwell was with us. We had um, a fire engine from Station One that was sort of our grand marshal, and we went through one of our neighborhoods where we know. Um, infant mortality is high, 37207, and we handed out and tossed out information on um, breastfeeding, safety. We also handed out masks and sanitizer. So forward thinking, what are we going to do? We have not yet reviewed our first COVID-19 case, but we know it is coming. We are preparing to expand on sensitivity training with other organizations to address bias. 
very much like the Racial Equity Institute training that we participated in in 2019. And we're also looking to invite uh, members from the Latinx community and the LGBTQ community to participate on our committee. I think I'll stop there and see if there are questions. Can you uh, help me? Um, and this is, first of all, I appreciate what you guys have done. I don't think your presentation, I know there's so much more to it, the work you all do, and the three years that have been on the board is always impressive. Thank you. Um, just from my own knowledge, um, as informative, what is the national average in general uh, and for 1,000? So where would we stand nationally? Within, and I see the big discrepancy between four for white, 14 plus one for um, black babies. Nationally, how do we rank compared to others? Do you, do you know that? So Tennessee is ranked number 11 in the nation for highest rate of infant mortality, um, number 11. And where are we in Tennessee, you know, like Nashville? Um, yes, Davidson County, 7.1. So we're set, um, seven, like we're the seventh worst in Tennessee? No, no, no. Um, like in Davidson County, it's 7.1. The average. And then where's that compared to the national standard? Or to, and I'm sorry, people, I'm just trying to get a sense of, sure. as a community, are we, I mean, no death is waiver. Are we right. are we better than, than most? Are we worse than worse? Are we the same as everyone else? I'm just trying to get a sense of where we rank compared to We're not in a good position. Okay. We're we're definitely not in a good position. The United States average is five point oh. seven. Five point seven. Uh, the Tennessee average is seven point two for the overall state. And we're right there with and for Davidson County we're at seven point one. And then when we extrapolate a little bit for Davidson County and look at white, black, yeah. and Latina, that's when we have that huge disparity between black infants dying and other groups. Okay. Uh, yeah. And again, Tennessee is ranked 11th in the nation, so we're, we're like almost in the top 10 for baby dying. Okay. We're right there with Ohio and Louisiana and so forth. I mean, I think your description of three classes this year really, I mean, it hits me right when I was just having the Gardner. Last year, really, are you? Yeah, I just wanted to add back to, to his question of the 95 counties. Are we, uh, as an urban area, it's, it's always going to be worse than the urban areas like Nashville, Memphis, uh, Knoxville? Do they break it down in terms of what counties are are leading the um, bad death? The worst county, according to uh, statistics and FE in Tennessee is Madison, uh, that area. Really? Because the rural areas have problems that the urban areas don't have, but they still have a high infant mortality rate. They don't have a lot of um, access to obstetrical care. Right. Um, it's you know, few and far between, so there are some different uh, problems that they have, but rural and urban um, in Tennessee were not doing very well. We could do better. There's work to be done. And then one last, one last question. Maybe not last question, but um, and I apologize if I forgot the name of the program, but um, there was a federal grant, a pretty significant one, because of the great work that was done here. Um, the strong baby thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can, have we? Is that is the success of that program continuing? I guess is, is, do you have enough data yet to know if that? Um, because obviously with the, with the federal grant. You know, we're expanding what we're doing. I mean, is that work still? Have you been able to notice that continued success of that program had um, in a smaller scale now on a bigger scale? Well, I can tell you that we are partnering with National Strong Baby to um, talk with moms yeah. about um, making sure that they're healthy before they get pregnant, okay. making sure that after they deliver, that they go to those follow-up visits with their physician and so on. Um, Natural Child Babies is um, a program that is in maternal child and adolescent health that someone else directs that. Sure, sure. So, um, but we do, co we do collaborate. Thank you. And I think they're wonderful. Yes, Ms. You mentioned that you are preparing to expand on what the sensitivity training and I participated in the racial and equity yeah. training. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you hope 
sort of what is your strategy for expanding on that size training and what you hope to gain? What is the impact that we can expect to see? Well, um, thanks. That's a great question. The people that serve on our state review team and our community action team are, are just like other folks in the world. Some of them come with bias and some don't. And so one of the things that we did is when we came back from the Racial Equity Institute training is we tried to present that to our committee. So that's one thing. We just tried to open the door and help people be comfortable talking about disparities and inequity because it is a tough conversation to have. It is very difficult, and particularly in the past um, political climate in, in, in the world and everything, it's been difficult to talk about. So that's number one. Number two, um, again, we do have money to bring in speakers and workshops and things like that, and so I'm very hopeful that we might be able to get REI or someone like that to come back and our committee um, be able to participate in that. So, um, we cannot address the disparate treatment between uh, black, white, and Latina babies until we're ready to look at some of the hard facts. And that means looking at historical trauma, that means looking at mistrust of the government, and um, I think somebody from the outside would be really great to present that. Thank you. Yeah, so critical. Um, any of my colleagues on the um, group that virtually want to speak? Uh, yeah, I, I did have a question about the trend for the underrepresented minorities. Uh, how how have you have you noticed any changes in that trend uh, with the onset of the uh, the community action teams and the community review? Uh, I'm just interested to know if that trend is improving as a result of the onset of those, or if the trend is uh, staying the same, or what? Well, you know, we have long-term goals and we have short-term goals, and we have had success in many of our short-term goals. But some of our long-term goals are just that, and, and it's going to take a long time to address those. But again, if, if you think about the fact that we've had a 42% decrease in infant-related uh, uh, flea deaths, that's huge. Um, we can't emphasize that enough. Um, I have the numbers from our epidemiology department for the past 10 years, and uh, I'm looking at those as we speak, and our numbers are sort of hovering right around the same, um, if that makes sense. So in 2009, uh, Davidson County was at 7.7, .7, and in 2018, we're at 7.1. But we came down just a little bit. Um, our non Hispanic black babies in 2009, the rate was 14.3, and today is, or 2018, which was the last year for when we have complete numbers, it was 14.1. So, some successes and still a long way to go. One, one quick follow up on that. Is there any uh, data? Uh, identifying particular like hospitals that have associations with higher rates or uh, anything of, of that nature? Is that something that is being considered a thought of? You know, we work with all of the birthing hospitals in Davidson County, and we are under a confidentiality agreement. And so when our nurse abstractor um, gets that information from the medical record, when we present it to our case review team, we do not include the hospital. Um, we do not include the mother's name. Um, everything is de-identified. And that's part of the law, Tennessee Code annotated, that allowed FEMA to come into existence over a decade ago. So um, in the spirit of community partnership, we would not mentioned a hospital that had um, numbers that were not impressive. We would not mention that in public. What we would probably do is go to our 
uh, administrator, go to our bureau chief, and from there ask if we could maybe have a lesser or have a meeting and have Dr. Caldwell sign off on that. Sure, that's that's more in keeping with what I'm I'm trying to get at is whether there's a plan in action for particular. Local. I mean, it sounds as though there is some you know organization in terms of that, but uh, for the trend to be not really going down very much. I mean, from 14.3 to 14.1 is really disturbing. So, uh, just want to. What what else can we do <laughs> to try to improve that? Well, I, I, I thank you for that. Uh, it is disturbing to us also, the four of us that work on this, on this all of the time. And again, we're talking about, uh, this is a historical perspective. Um, Dr. Art James and others have done a beautiful job at this, and I'm probably going to butcher it up a little bit. But we're looking at 400 years of differences in the way black babies and black women, black families have been treated. And so we're not going to be able to overcome that in a year or two. Um, we, we have to make sure that people understand um, that black women are not having um, problems with their pregnancies because they're black. They're having problems with their pregnancies because of systemic racism. And so the TH Chan School of Public Policy at Harvard um, has some papers on this that are very good. Um, the CDC has some information. Um, and, and so that's what we're trying to explain in a very sensitive way to our case review team members and to our CAT members. Um, it, it's not just that the woman was black, but it is the systemic racism that her body endures day in and day out. Um, another person that you might want to look up is uh, Dr. Geronimus from the University of Michigan. Um, a long time ago, she talked about this theory of weathering. Weathering. And what that means is that if you had a black woman who was 32, a white woman who was 32, they're both the same age, um, same educational level, and all those things, the black woman's body is going to show up as if she's 45 or 50 in terms of vascular disease and, and things like that. This, this, this is typical. I'm butchering up a little bit, but again. No, you, you're hitting it up. You, you, I, I'm familiar with it, and you are, are on point with it, and that, that makes a lot of sense. And I just wanted on the record that we're addressing it from the systemic point of view, and then you're doing a fantastic job of that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Um, so this is this is one of the reasons. So this is just one particular topic, and and Pops and I really do appreciate you sharing, and you shared last year too. Um, and so this is this is why we've advocated. I've advocated for to make sure that there is a position that addresses racial and health equity. Um, this is just one example, but the systemic um, root of our health outcomes and the health very particularly with with black and brown individuals here in the state and county of Tennessee. That's that's why we need a focus to be on racial and health equity and the upstream uh, factors that contribute to that. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you. Yeah. And one of the big highlights in these years on the board was attending the event at Tony Sudafu's home. It was the spring of 2019. Yes. And um, I have a picture of you <laughs> and others, Deanna. Yes, and yes. Deanna put a lot of work in that. So just a major shout out to you guys over the years. All righty. Uh, I just want to yes, one other comment, uh, which I think is really important for why we're facing such an uphill climb here in Davidson County in Tennessee is that uh, there are 37 states that have now uh, expanded Medicaid uh, through the Affordable Care Act, and Tennessee is not one of them. And there is no doubt that that should be a major uh, focus to address this issue that Schreiber just brought to the board's attention. If the state of Tennessee were to 
expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, we would see progress. And I, I think that it's our job uh, as leaders to articulate how important that is and how much our citizens are suffering because the state has not moved in that direction. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, you're welcome to stay, of course, but I suspect you probably have other things you can do. Uh, <laughs> but thank you. This, this is always, and I just these numbers really, I have known, but then we bring up and really try to get home. Okay, thank you. Dr. Caldwell, um, we're going to review the draft for organizational chart that we discussed last week. Um, we're going to have dialogue, but um, I, I, I don't anticipate any vote on anything today just for the, my colleagues who are all my colleagues. Just know what my mind is, that, um, but of course, it's an open meeting, so you have to do what you want. With that said, Dr. Caldwell. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Zanger. Uh, no, I'm not uh, asking for any action on the board today. I look at this as a continuing dialogue and feedback. I've uh, been uh, continuing to meet with each of you individually to go into detail uh, with uh, the process as well as expansion of, of the narrative I've, I've given you. And uh, what you have in your packet is a continuation of that uh, uh, evolution and, and hearing feedback and moving forward. So uh, you'll see the three different draft work charts. One is what I listed as current programs with my current direct reports of 14, one being vacant, so then I have 13 direct reports. And that uh, one of the major areas of improvement I like is to reduce that number of direct reports down to uh, five, which is uh, in the uh, third chart there, which is the original. Uh, uh, sort of ideal uh, chart that I kind of put, gave to you in the uh, uh, oversight of, of the net with the narrative that I gave you. Uh, because there was a concern about money and, and referendum, I also included uh, a pre, a phase one pre referendum, which would um, sort of be sort of a, a middle point uh, discussion if we wanted to do a phase in approach. So I'm I'm taking the feedback I'm receiving. I'm trying to think of other ideas, uh, and this uh, continues to evolve. Uh, one thing that is moving forward, as we previously discussed, is the reconstitution of the Strategic Planning Performance and Evaluation Unit. And I'm really pleased to let you know that that process uh, for our strategic five-year strategic plan uh, has uh, started and is uh, ongoing, and it's getting really great feedback by all those uh, who are involved in our participating. And our goal is to get the entire uh, department to participate in some way. And also, uh, as you know, you met Dr. Rand Carpenter, our new chief epidemiologist, just at, at our last meeting. Uh, he's now been on uh, for, uh, I guess, just about six, uh, seven weeks now. So the reconstitution of the epidemiology unit is one as a uh, Trevor said she went to our epidemiology uh, division, or she, so yes, we actually now uh, are, are reconstituting our, our epidemiology unit under the leadership of Dr. Ann Carpenter. So uh, we're transitioning those uh, each of the individual epidemiologists to report to Dr. Carpenter and you know, continue to serve in their role and their current um, positions where they are uh, in, in their uh, specific uh, categorical programs, but really to have that more uh, cohesive uh, uh, leadership and connectivity in a unit, and as well as the notifiable diseases uh, is transitioning there, uh, as had always been uh, uh, identified as, as uh, a need. Um, so other than that, everything else is uh, continues to operate uh, normally. I, I am working to uh, have some leadership conversations. Uh, if you go to um, the, either the chart two or three, uh, among those identified programs and, and areas, uh, so we could start dialoguing and get ideas of uh, should we move forward in this way? You know, how can we uh, start thinking about working together? And is there any additional feedback that we can get that might influence maybe some of these should be moved around a little bit? Uh, so, 
I'll, I'll conclude my initial remarks there and, and be happy to answer any questions. So I look forward to uh, providing more one-on-one uh, -on -one feedback with you uh, and, and perhaps having something to present to the board that might be able to be voted on by November, and if not, then, then shortly thereafter. But I don't want to come to the board to ask you to vote on something until we've had a, a, a all a time to review this, to ask questions, and, and to present something that everybody here on the board uh, feels comfortable that they want to move forward with. So I'll stop there. For the moment. If I may, uh, last time I did say, um, I ask for feedback, and um, I appreciate everyone uh, that's watching feedback that's been provided to me and to other board members. Um, I did want to, as I promised last time, give an opportunity if anyone wants to publicly at this meeting give any feedback. And nobody actually reached out and say they'd like to, but I, I will welcome if anyone who's currently on or has access to being on would like to say anything. Speak now. Okay. Um, Okay, so those, that's that. Uh, um, and now I open the dialogue to my colleagues. Um, any questions, comments? Um, yeah. Our response, Carol, why don't you go first? Okay, well, first of all, let me say, Dr. Paulo, it's really nice to have you in the room with us. I think this is the first time we've had the opportunity to be back in the boardroom. And um, you have met with each of us and uh, given us a lot of a lot of information about what and how you want to to do something, at least the what. I'm going to make a really strong request for what I guess we would call a retreat. I don't remember us having a retreat in quite a long time. We've had special sessions that we haven't at the board. And so we're not able to talk among ourselves uh, even though it's an open forum, it's really difficult to, to have a sense of where are we all aligned, given our different conversation with you, and also after Alex invited persons to contact us, we have a lot of information and, and we have a lot of differing thoughts and opinions that have come to us. So in fairness to this process, I'm going to ask um, that we do set a time for a meeting that we may call a retreat and that in that we have a much clearer understanding of how you think this strategy is an improvement. And I'm talking about specifics. And what you think the drawbacks are to it and how you arrived at this. What kinds of, I know you've gone around and talked with lots of people in the department. What I don't know, maybe others of you do, is to what extent, to what extent have you really listened to their thoughts, their ideas, their responses to this? And I'm sure that there are some who feel really positive about it, others who do not. But I think that we're just kind of running in circles to try and address this in board meetings solely. So it's not just the organizational chart or design, it's what it stands for. And uh, um, the process of how a dramatic change has come about and what, what, may, it, what may it be um, if, it, if it were to come to fruition. Also, in that time, I'd like to know more about COVID and what your plans are and how your plans will fall out, as well as others in the department, in terms of, while we can't predict where COVID is going, we can predict more readily what our responsibility is to it in coming um, months, because it's certainly going to be around. So that's another thing that I would like to have on, on, a, on a retreat agenda. And I'd certainly like to understand where are we financially with all of this, both in terms of um, what it would mean if there were these kinds of changes made on the organizational chart, what would it mean to the budget? Uh, 
what would it mean to the department in terms of where and how we're uh, filling in gaps. Um, and then with COVID and uh, the COVID monies that have come in, how and what are we doing with that? And those are two things I would really like to see on a retreat. And we can talk about this a lot. Yeah, but a retreat just, before the next or, or within the I just think before the year. year. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'd like others to, to disagree or, or agree. I mean, I'm speaking for everybody, but <laughs> I don't mean to do that. I agree, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I agree with everything that you said. So I, I heard you talk today, the org chart, um, sort of the plan for COVID and our response. And, and I, would, I, would, I would like an, a, a detailed overview of where we are financially with CARES dollars, with yeah. the budget. So everything financial, that's the third one that I would really does it make sense to you, and then we'll throw it out to the others, does it make sense to you, because we are able to sit here and, and do it directly, that we're asking for that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You're asking, absolutely. Yeah. Because I think you've, you've given us information that, from your perspective, makes it, that is very clear. Unfortunately, it isn't, and it doesn't g haul with a lot of other information. Yeah, and I, and I, I, I thoroughly understand that, and I'm happy to continue to dialogue. I want everyone to ask questions and uh, challenge me to provide answers. I, I think this is going to make a stronger process moving forward. Well, hopefully it'll be easier for you if we do it more yeah, from a group perspective. I, I, I'm, group. I'm happy to do it any way that you feel comfortable uh, doing it as a board, uh, absolutely. Um, what, what I do know, and what I would like also, as you continue to reflect on feedback you're getting, is uh, ask yourself uh, where that perspective is. And, and like my perspective is the whole organization and the connectivity and all that. And uh, so the feedback to me that is really helpful is to help me design a better functioning department overall, as opposed to these programs and those programs like they're working just fine by themselves, leave them alone. That, that's good to hear. Whatever feedback anyone wants to provide, I think is very valuable. However, I'm taking a step back to see how it all works together. And that's one thing that I find most valuable when uh, my colleagues in the department and even other um, advisors, of course you as well as others, can take that step back and see how it's all working together. Because I think that for me, as I, I learn about the history, uh, more recent history, as well as just what I walked into, I think really has room for improvement. And I don't think we would just, you know, disagree with uh, over the years, there's been a lot of energy put into steps. And I think that's one reason that those of us who've been on the board for a while are perhaps, in your opinion, taking a, a more major role than normally to try and understand the specifics of how this is going to play out, but also not just what the department's going to look like. What is your role in doing it? Because that's not as clear to me. And I mean, one, one might think a, a director's role is, is just there, but it isn't. And we need to hear very specifically what you feel your primary responsibilities are and, and how they can work through whatever organization is that. Okay. Well, the very fact that we're having this discussion is my role, my vision, my leadership. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you my ideas to put forth. So that's something that I know that you were very interested in when you wanted to hire a new director that was strong, that had good ideas and vision. So. This is my vision, and I want to make it work. And, and one other thing I'd say is this, this is a vision that, yes, it comes from my years of experience uh, before I got here, being here, and other experience I've, I've had both in government and outside of government, and, and being very focused on, on, on uh, health and public health. My background is an internist. and. Um, preventive medicine focused, uh, and as well as my years of experience in, in media as well. Um, but but I, I, look, I look at this as my job is to leave this department when I, 
when I depart someday better than I found it and it's functioning better. Uh, and and the, the, I, I'm always thinking of the, the next director of public health to leave them with the tools and a department that, that is uh, uh, more cohesive and functioning. So, so I'm really looking at this as uh, you know, uh, improving the department to help the community. And I think we've already seen dramatic opportunities in that and being able to leverage our I can't hear anything. Lost audio. I can't hear anything either. I think everyone in the room got lost. Can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you. Uh, this is Dr. Caldwell. I'm, I'm uh, trying again. Did, did, was I, are, are you able to hear my words? Yeah, now? Dr. Dr. Smith and Dr. Campbell, can you hear us? Yes, yeah, yeah, I can hear now. Yes. yes. Dr. Frederick, can you hear us? David, are you, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, got it. I Dr. can. This is kind of a stupid question. If you can't hear me, you won't know I'm asking you. All right, I, sorry, Dr. Coma, please. Yeah, I, I was going to um, just conclude my thoughts. I, I uh, sorry if, if you missed a few sentences of what I said, but um, I think it just could be captured simply by saying uh, the vision I have to improve the organizational structure is one that I hope will be one that would be welcomed by future directors of health. Right. So um, I want to continue the dialogue. Um, I'll, I'll look forward to that. Anyone else have any dialogue around this? I just, I just sure. want to say that I, I talked with, I really do appreciate the feedback that I received. I, I, I feel that it was balanced feedback, well thought out from uh, team members that have been here with the health department. Um, so I just want to say thank you for, for all the feedback. It, it's been very informative and very balanced. I, I wanted to express the same kind of sentiment that uh, my colleague, Ms. Franklin, uh, expressed. I, I, I appreciate the time uh, for those that, that I was able to talk with and, uh, and kind of getting the background information as to where we are now, uh, which is very important for me, uh, you know, given that I'm, I'm the, the youngest or the newest member of the board. Uh, and, uh, and I also wanted to express my strong support for uh, uh, what my colleague, uh, Ms. Etherington, uh, mentioned. Uh, I think that would be very a very, very good idea. Uh, and would certainly be beneficial to me from a personal, uh, selfish level. Okay. Um, and I think you are the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> I'll own that too. That is now accurate, apparently. No, I, I had it. Um, Dr. Campbell or Mr. Frederick, um, any comments or thoughts that now? Well, I just want to support the idea of uh, having a retreat. I find it very awkward and difficult to process uh, what's happening and the information when I can't really uh, have a comfortable dialogue with colleagues and uh, staff in, in a kind of cohesive way to uh, integrate the information in a way that helps me understand what's going on and form uh, good uh, uh, decisions about where we should move. So I just want to support Carol's notion of uh, having a retreat to process some of this. Done. Mr. Frederick? I would, I would voice my support for that as well. Okay. And we will do that. I'll work with Martha to find some kind of maybe what I hear, maybe, maybe a past day type of event, talk about work hard, financial, and um, COVID response, especially moving forward into the next calendar year. Um, and we'll figure out the best way to do it. This may be the best way as we currently do it. Those who feel like they can be here, they can. And those of you who aren't in the room, we have doors open in the big really room, lots of distance. So we'll we'll figure out those logistics. So I, I think it's a great idea. I'll, I'll make that a priority. The one thing, Dr. Alba, that I think is, is critical also, um, once the North Park restructuring is, is done, you know, is that, that we talked about it, we need buy-in from a 
a lot of those people. But then also, um, I, I one thing I would love to have guidance on when we do meet um, in this retreat to dialogue more is um, all these new positions of deputy director, assistant director, population health, uh, community control, disease, and environmental health, which all appear to be new, like, you won't call undersecretary, that was their terminology. I'm, I'm just making that up. I would assume there would have to be some vetting of process, a vetting process of who goes to the position, right? Because I, I don't know, I guess my question is not, you don't have the answer today by any means, but under the civil service rules, how does one place people in those positions? And it could be a very simple, straightforward process, but I just think there has to be some transparency about how that happens, because um, if you're going from 12, 13 bureau directors now to theory five, um, senior leadership team, I would assume, in my understanding of the civil service stuff, is there has to be some fair process and transparent process of who gets in those positions. So, please, no need to answer that right now, but please know that for me is, that is one of my biggest sticking points too. Of, of if a big reorg is done, that we have to, that we send to the council for their support. I need reassurance that that we follow the rules as, as defined by civil service rules of, that we have and it's consistent with standards of practice across similar civil service practices. That's I, 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 I want to say that would probably be a, a part of what I'd like to present at that retreat That'd as well as what the civil service rules of Metro, what they are for to help and what flexibility the board may have uh, to uh, change the rules that might better conform sure. to this. And then also I have appointments scheduled with the leadership at the Tennessee Department of Health to learn about what their structure is so that I can properly inform the board about what they're doing uh, and that whether that might be helpful to, to, to see uh, what is the same and what may be different sure. um, for op opportunities to think through. So one thing I'll, I'll just to now get down across the board members that that someone I want to discuss is, as a chair, I want to make sure our civil service rules are as consistent as all of Metro civil service rules. In general, just so you know where I stand, I don't want to leave it out, but I, I just have a lot of heartburn when I all of a sudden say we can change the rule to accommodate the I, My goal will always be to have as consistent civil service rules as the rest of Metro government, uh, unless there's a clear reason health needs to be an exception. That's my philosophy. Uh, I don't know where anyone else stands on that, but it's not a dialogue we need to have now, but just so you know where I stand on that one topic and the rest of the board can hear that too. Um, but okay, no, I think these are great things to talk about. I appreciate the idea of retreat. I'll try to, we will find a few dates between now and the end of the calendar year um, to make sure we do this. I know this is critical and um, a lot of great things. So thank you for bringing it up. Thank you, Dr. What other dialogue around this issue do we have? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Ms. Larson, we're going to talk about grants and contracts and applications. I believe Ms. Larson is going to speak. Yes, uh, she just maybe she's on you. I see uh, her. I see her name. Yes, she is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, you can hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, board members. Um, I'll be presenting uh, one grant application and four grants and contracts for your approval. Uh, the grant application uh, that we're presenting is one to Best Friend Society's Rachel Rigg program. And this is a program we have received funding previously. Um, and this program will fund Metro Animal Care and Control's safety net program in the amount of $50,000. These funds will be used to provide resources to needy families in order for them to retain their pets versus surrendering, surrendering them to Matt. Uh, I'll move on to the grants and contracts. Uh, the uh, first, we, uh, yes. Uh, or Dr. Larson, excuse me. Um, we need to approve that specific application. Oh, okay, I apologize. Oh, no problem. So is there any discussion for this and or a motion to approve this application? Move to approve. Motion to approve. Is that the intent? Or second? Second. I saw Mr. Frederick's hand go up. I'll take it. Any other discussion? If not, I'll do a roll call. Ms. Franklin? Aye. Is that the intent? Aye. Um, Dr. Smith? 
Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mr. Cable? Aye. All right, great. Um, so the grant application has been approved. Thank you. All right, please press on. Okay, thank you. Um, we have four grants and contracts for which we're seeking approval. Uh, the first is our EPA funded air pollution 103 grant that supports PM2 monitoring, and this is the amount of $260,000. Uh, the second is a grant we receive on an ongoing basis as well from uh, the Tennessee Department of Health for our tobacco, tobacco prevention and cessation efforts. And this is in the amount of $98,400. The third is a contract, a five-year contract with STARS, who you may be familiar with, a youth-serving youth organization in our community. And this contract will fund an epidemiologist who will support data collection and analysis. And uh, this these tasks that epidemiologists will be involved in is supporting an intervention to decrease substance misuse and electronic cigarette use among youth in Nashville. And over the five years, this is in the amount of uh, $379,000. The last is an MOU amendment, um, and this is using uh, CARES Act funding uh, that will support nursing services for our school health program, which I know you're all familiar with. Um, and this is in the amount of twelve million eight hundred thousand. And uh, those are the the ones we have for this evening. Question for dialogue. Okay. Hearing none. Uh, is there a motion to approve these? Motion to approve. Ms. Franklin, motion. There a second. Second. That's been 10. All right. Any other dialogue? All right. Uh, Ms. Franklin? Yes. Aye. That's been 10. Voted. Oh, aye. Uh, Mr. Frederick? Aye. Campbell? Aye. And Dr. Smith? Aye. All right. Thank you. I'm really excited about the school nursing Isn't that something? Yeah. That's Dr. Really Caldwell good. said that the other day. All these years we've been trying to get a nurse in every school yeah. and it took a pandemic to do it. So. Well, I think that's, that's, a really, that's a really great, I'm, I, I, I'm very proud of that program. I'm glad, thank you. All right. Um, thank you. I'll go up. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, and we will, uh, in, in a moment, have Lisa Nistler uh, provide a, a little bit of an update specifically on, on where we are with all the uh, school nurse uh, being hired, but first let me take a moment to pause and reflect on another loss we've had. Uh, Carl Sutton uh, in clinical services, one of our longtime staff members who's been with us for over 20 years, passed away November 2nd. And uh, it'll be very, uh, very missed, especially here. And uh, we've had uh, work with Center Stone to have some grief counseling. So it's been a real hard week on, on a lot of us here. Uh, who know Carl? And even if just saw his smile, but yeah, it's been uh, it's been hard, and uh, I want to just uh, let uh, everyone uh, who worked with him, uh, who knew him, his family know that we're thinking of him, uh, and uh, he just uh, what is there a place? Uh, so other uh, issues um, that I just wanted to. Uh, pull out from the written director's report in addition to all the other information you get was uh, about the school nurse uh, program. And I've asked Lisa Nistler, she's joined us. So Lisa, if you could kind of give us an update uh, on where we are uh, with what, how many sort of nurses we did have, where we're going and, and how we are uh, uh, ramping up and uh, some of the challenges that uh, you're facing as well as what you've overcome. So Lisa, thank you so much. Ms. Nestler, are you on? I see that she's, here. she's uh... Okay, uh, but we don't, we don't All right, hear her. I see you. I see you moving. She said one minute. Got it. Okay. Okay. 
Where, where do we? Where do you see them? You're right here. I mean, so. <laughs> I'm not seeing it. Here. All right, why don't you continue and then no. um, okay. we'll be right back to this. Keep doing what you're doing. Go ahead. Yeah. Go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Joe is on the way. So as soon as, uh, yeah, as soon as we get going. So uh, I would like to tell you all that this, um, this uh, Saturday, we are working with Plaza Mariachi on a, a Live Out Love Nashville drive-through health fair. And this has been something that uh, Deputy Mayor Brenda Haywood also has been very involved in. And uh, a number of our staff, including Dr. Shaw Kai Kai, has been working uh, with uh, the Hispanic Family Foundation. Uh, it's going to be this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. We'll be starting the setup at 7 a.m. And it's, it's going to be a real uh, special event. Uh, we expect a lot of good attendance. We've been working with the owners of Plaza Mariachi. Uh, we, we built some good relationships with them over time, especially on the night of the debate, actually, CNN had uh, some uh, broadcasting from there. And Dr. Shaw Kai Kai and Katie Stone represent the health department there and got to interact uh, with a number of uh, colleagues there at Plaza Mariachi. So uh, this health fair, this Saturday, 9 to 2, is going to be providing uh, um, an opportunity for us to partner with many other partners, uh, not just the, the health department, uh, but we'll be providing flu shots, screenings, blood pressure checks, diabetes, vision tests, dental, and much more. So our, our dental program will be there. Uh, the Shade Tree Clinic will uh, be represented, um, and, uh, and and many others. Uh, so we're, we look forward to, to that. Um, and uh, is this you ready? Is Ms. Nistler ready? Is, is that fair to call we'll go back to Ms. Nistler? Yes, I, I do. I, I, I have it now, I think. Hear you, Lisa. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop it and pause so you can uh, give your update then. Okay, sorry about that. It just all of a sudden quit. Um, all right, so uh, just to give you a little bit of an update, uh, we, um, when we st started... We, all right, I'm not going to start with that. I'm going to start with, we right now are at the, at the end of this week are going to be, have placed 29 nurses that we've um, acquired from this, uh, you know, the new funding and the new strategy. Um, and so that leaves us, our original plan was to have 67 and that included 10 float nurses people that come to work every day and then are float out, floated out to cover absences. And so that w our original plan was 67, and so it means we've got about 38 to go. But combined with that, we, you know, talking about barriers, we do have 10 vacancies of our own. We had a lot of people retire at the end of last school year, and we've not um, been able to replace them it, as fast as we usually do. And part of that is because um, there's now this competition with the agencies that they're acquiring nurses that maybe perhaps would have come on. But if, you know, funding is continued, what we have found is usually we start out with people that work through the agency and then they enjoy the job and then they come on board. So, um, but that is one of our biggest challenges is trying to find um, personnel mm -hmm. to fill our own positions that are vacant. Um, and, but on the, what we are doing is um, a, there's obviously a shift in focus with school nurses. Uh, currently only elementary schools are in session. We do have a nurse in every elementary school building. We've like deployed some of our high school nurses where there aren't any students to elementary um, schools. So we've done some rearranging of our own staff just so that we have nurses present in places where there are uh, students. And um, the focus of school nursing, as we predicted in the spring, was that, you know, the front line at, in the spring was really frontline healthcare workers focused on hospitals and everything like that. 
and now the shift has been to the front line is really moved to the schools. And so our nurses are there. We've partnered with our EPI team and we're doing um, initial investigations for the schools. And so far we've investigated over 3,200 people for COVID, uh, either symptoms, cases, or close contacts. So the nurses are incredibly busy doing these investigations and, you know, providing, um, you know, providing the service to the schools. Uh, you know, when I talked with Leslie about this last week, you know, one of the things that she acknowledged was how important it was that the nurses are doing this because instead of five days after a positive is known to a family, um, we are, instead of that finally getting to the epi team and people getting quarantined through that process, we are getting people out of schools as soon as they let the schools know that they're positive or if a family knows that there are kids, students are close contacts. And so it really is getting um, potentially infectious people and infectious people out of the schools a lot faster. And so um, that was one comment that uh, Leslie had that was in support of our nurses continuing to do these investigations. So that's a real brief update. Um, I'm not sure if you have any questions about what we're, we're doing, but I feel like we're steadily bringing people on every week. We have a group, so we start every group on a Monday, and then they go through uh, an acclimation process, and then we place them in the schools at the end of the week with a school health nurse partner who very closely works with that person every day to help them uh, assimilate into the school health role, the school nurse role. All right, thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to greeting the, the next uh, arrivals on Monday. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to do an update I'm anytime. Hold on. Um, my question is what you anticipate as the Christmas holidays are coming up and are we, do, the way that these positions have been filled with these nurses, we're pretty confident that we'll have these nurses after the holidays and, and they're pretty secure? Yes. Yeah. They, they, um, so after the, everybody, it, we're very transparent and the agencies are very transparent with them that this is a, you know, that there is going to be a break and that they are going to, when they come on, they are to, they already anticipate that they are going to be off those weeks, of course, with, and, you know, they, without pay, but they knew that coming on. And so I don't have any um, worries that we're going to lose people. I mean, you know, there's going to be attrition no matter what we how we talk, you know, in any organization. Um, but, you know, they, they understand that we're going to pick right back up in January. And with, and a lot of times the questions that I get to is, well, what, what will the nurses do if school were to close? And school closing now would look very differently than it did in the spring when they just, um, everybody went home and there was no more school. But as I talked about the last time, um, with you guys, uh, the, the nurses are still school nurses for those schools. And as long as schools are in session, whether it be in, uh, uh, in the buildings or virtually, we are still the school nurses and there's plenty of work to do should the district go completely virtual. Good. I'm glad you reminded us that that was the case. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, I, you know, I think about it all the time. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Uh, okay, thanks other, again. Thanks. Uh, I have just two other items uh, to bring to your attention uh, from the uh, written uh, report. One is the uh, we had a really strong breast cancer awareness month uh, in October. Um, we uh, highlighted by uh, a number of things that are, are written here. Specifically, we have participated in a a panel discussion at the Lake Providence Missionary Baptist Church 
uh, our wear pink day uh, at the health department raised over a thousand dollars for the uh, Susan G. Komen Foundation. Those are, um, uh, you know, just our own staff donating. Uh, and uh, there were a number of uh, specific promotional displays, and I, I got to participate myself with one with Doris Campbell uh, at uh, one of the uh, recent Tennessee uh, uh, Titans games. We were able to partner with the NFL. Uh, on augmenting what they are doing for breast cancer awareness. Uh, the last issue I just thought was really important to bring to your attention also in your packet, which is the uh, updated drug overdose uh, uh, numbers uh, from November. And just to highlight this for you and those listening, that we now have more uh, uh, fatal drug overdoses, non-fatal drug overdoses, emergency department visits, and suspected drug overdoses, more than we've ever had. And uh, if you look uh, at the chart of 2020, you'll see we have a total of 516 fatal drug overdoses this year in Davidson County. That's a 34.7% increase from last year. Uh, there were 1,979 non-fatal drug overdoses in Mercy Department visits. That's about a 31% increase over last year. And then uh, the suspect drug overdose, over 5,000 cases, that's about a 40% increase over last year. So I hope that these new monthly reports are, are valuable, helpful for you, uh, and we continue to uh, make this a priority uh, and to do everything that we can uh, in a very leadership uh, way. Uh, and I know uh, uh, Board Member Etherington, you, you went to spend time with the program and saw some of the really uh, um, uh, leadership type of uh, ways we're, we're doing this with um, new technology and a real time partnership with EMS. And I, I would invite each board member to, if they could get time, to spend with our team there to see we're doing some things that are uh, emerging as a national model. So while we do have uh, great challenges. Uh, we are leading the way uh, and getting recognized uh, nationally for the work that we're doing. So that concludes my uh, oral report. Thank you. Um, hey, Alex. Yeah. Uh, pardon the interruption. I need to note for the record that I put an error in the director's report in the testing number. I fat fingered that number. It's not 30,000. Uh, uh, I'll send out an amended version. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, and I don't know I, that we can pack the, uh, if we are having a, a, a thing, but I do, I do think that these statistics, um, as you heard me say last time, are stunning. Yeah. And because of COVID, it, is, it doesn't get the news media coverage that, that it probably should, but this, the scariest thing is the fentanyl from my perspective and the fact that a lot of these deaths, if I understood correctly, are not intentional. These are people dying because they got something in a drug buy that they thought was just going to give them a high and it took their life. And I just really am, am wondering how, how, um, this team is doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job. But if there's any way that Trevor or Josh or, or if we can put them on just to give you some insights very briefly, as I got, I think yeah, that's I'm going to do this. Are you talking about at one of our retreat? retreat. At, uh, at the retreat, if we have time. Oh, if oh we okay. Have time, we, we can, yeah. we can make time. I, I'm just yeah. going to be very, once you figure out a time, date, and everything, I'll, I'll make a, I'll be a stickler for time. I think it's great. Yeah, I think this is, and you bring it, you bring the point. This is um, a crisis that, that any other time right, would, would be. All and, over and I think some coverage, but I think you're right. I think so. Yeah, makes all sense. We should all be more process to it. So really quickly, Doctor um, uh, Caldwell, could you just say if, if, if you're aware? That STI, STD uh, testing, which I'm sure is just going very well, but they're they're identifying uh, the STDs in the pregnant women, and um, 
do you know if we're tracking whether or not once that's identified in our patients that we're tracking that they are coming either back or going somewhere for treatment? Yeah, I, I would hope that we are, uh, and I, I can give you that data. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, what, what, what is really, I'm glad you brought up, what is really extra special uh, to know here is that um, uh, with Laura Barnia's uh, leadership also has started to do that testing of hep C in all new patients, yeah. and we've identified a number. So not only can we get them uh, treated but cured of hep C, so it's really exciting, and it's gotten the... Uh, uh, notice of the state health department and what because of something that was created and instituted here might not only happen in uh, other parts of the state but maybe across uh, the country so really great great um, work is laura on here excuse me is laura on here uh, no no but the sd uh, that's her name is not no I, I mean if she was on here she could say whether or not oh, oh, they're no, coming she, to she's us actually be taking uh, november uh, off uh, Thank you. The, the Hi, um, this is Dr. Shaw Kaikai. I can speak to that. Our um, STD and HIV outreach team do an excellent job reaching out to these women um, and bringing them in. So um, whether they're, we're notifying them and they're coming in or we're getting a referral from the doctor's office, our DIS team are, are on it and they get these women in to be treated. And we usually give a, give a report to their um, and physicians. Super, thank you. Thanks, doctor. Any other questions, dialogue that anyone would like to have? Okay, thank you, Dr. Um, the report of the chair is the, the chair report is the. I mean, I think I give the report pretty regularly on, on what's going on. Um, I think I just want to highlight um, testing is something that, that I'm very proud of what we've done at the city. We've tested over 570,000 people. The assessment center that, that we run has, has, has provided over 250,000 free tests, or around 250,000 free tests. Um, we are increasing testing hours during the Thanksgiving week before and after. Now three days a week in the evenings we have available, um, at three different at, at three separate um, metro school sites uh, provide testing for anyone, but it's kind of geared to provide some, some testing more for uh, metro school families who want to do this. Um, Mahari is, is running weekend sites um, in addition to what we as um, a department are, are doing in the Mahari sites are obviously supported by us financially, but they're, they take the leadership on that. So we're doing, we're increasing testing to make this invisible disease more visible. Um, and I think I just want to highlight that, and it's really good work with a lot of people. Um, stay vigilant, I think we're, we're doing fine. And I think I'm staying in this COVID, I am focusing on, on the other parts of the department as well. And, Touched on some of those today, and I think the retreat idea will be a good one. So, um, I'm an open door. If anyone wants to discuss anything with me, feel free to reach out. Um, not board members, but any of the staff. Um, but any questions of me? I think that may be a better way to. I have a question. I just was concerned about uh, one of the uh, reports that shows uh, there's on increasing lag phase between the testing and getting the results from the lab and how much is that interfering with yeah. the contact right. tracing so um clarify the there's, a, there's a lots of different ways to analyze that question plus answer if you guys have some over assessment type i confirmed this this morning with right within one one and a half days let's say two days that result is back so you can look on the, the website and call it hotline. So that is critical. So what a report that if you want, let me look it up. I just got this email this um, I think this afternoon, the most updated number. When a when we as a city get a, a positive test result from um, from um, the state. So the way it works, so the city lots we get, you know, they all go through this system called NDS. That's the state site. 
when the state forwards that on to us, where the contract safety starts, within um, within one day, 91, and this is for the past two weeks, just so you know my data, 91.7% of investigations are, are started within 24 hours. 85.9% of those are finished within 24 hours of us when the city epidemiologist or the contact tracing team receives the data. And within two days, 96.2% .2 of the investigations are complete. Okay? So the key there is that is from when we, and then 2.4% of cases are just lost to follow up. People aren't, don't pick up, people don't, whatever. The key is the live things you're hearing, I, I, I don't believe, I'm pretty confident, are from the lag and the delay and how long the state system is taking to get us the data. Okay, so if I get tested at the Vanderbilt lab or if I'm in Tampa and get tested in Tampa, that positive result goes to the state first and then comes to us. I think that's where the lag is coming. Our department, because of um, the people we have here, we've now employed some texting technology. We've employed, um, we contract with um, a company that the state also contracts with to serve as uh, augment to our our workforce for this contact tracing stuff, to be able to get those results I just mentioned to you. Um, and I think the message of if you get tested at a city site, or if you don't, you get tested somewhere else and you find out you're positive, just do your, do your own diligence too, right? Just stay at home, um, contact your own contacts. Um, but the city is the numbers I just gave you, I literally got um, this afternoon right before the cold in the garage here, or the lot. Um, so I hope to answer your question, okay. Anything I want. Sure. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, well, it actually is going to fall into, I guess, maybe a board request. And I don't know if anybody else has been called, but I actually was called by, by some people, because I'm on the Board of Health, regarding the fact that in neighborhoods where the April marathon, the, the what do we call it now? The rock and roll marathon. The rock and roll, yeah, it's not Music City. Um, they're already hanging things on doors talking about traffic and talking about um, where not to park, et cetera. And folks are saying, how are we going to have 22,000 people in this city if we're still in a pandemic? So I don't know if that's come up for you. Yes, I, I, that, I brought it up myself today. With oh, okay, yeah, so yes, if we could talk about that in December, if you can just put uh, it on as a request. Well, uh, the, the, why don't we talk about yeah. it? Do you have, I, 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 I can give you a quick update. The marathon is before yeah, December. Yeah, before December. We yeah. can talk about it. Oh, I thought it was the one in... Oh, that's why they're getting. We can talk about that. Yeah, about it. Yeah. Yeah. Please, yeah. That's it. thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I've been in close contact with the leadership. Uh, we had about a, uh, over an hour uh, WebEx call with their leadership today. The uh, marathon event is not the one that you would normally visualize. Though people bunched up at the beginning, they have significantly reduced the number of attendees, and they uh, have really national uh, and international representation in assuring that it's a safe event. And I'd be happy. I'll look forward uh, with Martha South Board's uh, information of all the details that we got. Their plan, uh, their their web link. Uh, they are not going to have any more than 7,000 people. They're going to be working in uh, collaboration with Nissan Stadium, and we reviewed uh, their whole plan of how they're staggering uh, the start times and people's pickups and uh, the temperature checks and face mask wearing uh, at, at all times if they're not socially distanced. Uh, the majority of the 7,000 runners will be doing only the half marathon, only about 15, 1,600 will be doing the full marathon. Uh, and of course, yeah, I think without knowing all these details, you would think to yourself, you know, what you see at the beginning of a marathon, everybody bunched together and the crowds and the community that you'd be concerned. So yeah, we, we are concerned too, but we think the event can be done safely. I think, um, you know, tonight there's a, a game at the Nissan Stadium with the Titans. They are at their 21% capacity, and that is uh, a uh, done in, in uh, as low risk as we possibly can. Uh, and I can tell you that this, this event is, is going to be much uh, less of a risk than that overall once, once you learn about how it's being uh, done. Are the marathons done elsewhere right now? Uh, very few because they they don't have the kind of professionalism that this particular group has. So they've, they've uh, be adapted and adopted these new modified uh, strategies. And most people who would sign up for math, I don't want to run it anyway. Uh, 
so they were going to have up to 30,000 uh, people, but you know, oh, very few uh, even want to come, and they may even get some attrition. Can you help me out? How spread out is this back to the store? Like, like there's still 500 people in each other's 500 people. I think this is a great yeah, I've been asking to review the. I know you sent me this stuff. Right yeah, here I sent you, and, and I'm actually going to go and inspect the site on Tuesday uh, beforehand to, with, with some of our other staff to just get a visual. So we still have another week before this. That was, uh, not this weekend, but next weekend. Uh, Is this the one that's normally run in yeah. April? Yeah. Okay. So you can still register. So okay. they, they're still open for. People that want to register for the marriage. Yeah, the majority of people actually that come are people who are local anyway. Uh, I think so. They're not. It's not that we're getting thousands of people from other places. Uh, so uh, yeah, compared to what there are other things going on in the community, that I wish that everybody had this kind of level of um, thought about making sure everybody followed the rules. So we really are expecting. Good partnerships, but we're going to uh, you know, be uh, monitoring and, and assuring that they their plan is executed as well as it's written. So, I have a question. Slightly topic. Uh, could we get an update on exactly how we're working with clinical research associates? Are we part of the Pfizer vaccine study at all? Or what what what's going on with clinical research associates? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, with clinical with the Pfizer study, they uh, have concluded their um, enrollment. So uh, the only uh, participation we've had is being able to have looked at their protocol and to learn about what they're doing. So and we'll just supporting clinical research associates in their recruitment efforts, uh, as well as with Vanderbilt and Harry as well. Um, so we're doing that, uh, and uh, so that, that's the limit that we have with. So we're helping to recruit for, and what and what pharmaceutical companies are we helping to recruit for? With well, it's really the the places like we're helping Vanderbilt, Meharry, and and um, Clinical Research Associates. We're just trying to let people know about those portals, which is on the mayor's website about where people can participate, and then. Like clinical research associates or Vanderbilt or Meharry, they may have more than one study to recruit people for. So once they go through the um, the, the um, uh, have, having a conversation with them, they can let figure out which study they may want to participate in. I do know that uh, the clinical research associates also is proceeding with the AstraZeneca study. We we have not yet been asked to uh, help them see any patients in that. That is the one that we were probably going to be most involved in. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep you informed if, if that changes. Uh, there's an updated protocol because the study was paused that I haven't seen yet. Uh, and I believe that there's a, a, a few other studies that they're considering. I don't have the latest update. That's the most information I have about them. Well, may I, re after this have to be right now, but I would like to receive, I, I, need, I would like a better understanding of what exactly we're doing to help recruit for all of this trials. So what that language is, so okay. that's one of the asks, Martha. Okay, we'll do that. Thank so you. Martha, that's one ask. Another ask is help you and I work together to find a date for retreat in which we will discuss the org chart, financial stuff, COVID response, and our drug overdose statistics. And I'm summarizing the words, but that, that's those are four topics, and we'll other board members would like to have other topics in the Martha. Um, and we'll try to do it within a half a day, um, no more than that, in a safe manner. Is that fair, everyone? And um, other people ask, and, and then I'll get to you. Any other ask? Is that from, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Do we have uh, um, that minus 80 degrees refrigeration? Um, equipment that's going to be necessary for no. the vaccine, and are we have any plans we'll for distributing it? You know, maybe a better, better way. This, this, is Dr. Okay. Wright, Dr. Dr. Wright, I was going to say a better way to answer that yeah. is maybe at our retreat or our at the next board meeting, whichever comes sooner, we should get a uh, vaccine um, planning 
breathing. Yes. Yeah. So that yeah. With that said, Dr. Wright, if you want to answer that one question, that'd be good. I don't want to get us the whole vaccine we, planning because that changes. Right. It seems to change minute no. by minute. We have, we have six small coolers that are portable currently in the place that will hold hold uh, temp at minus 80 Celsius. And we have three large freezers, ultra cold freezers on order, actually back ordered. They're supposed to arrive probably next week to the end of the month is what we last heard. I have not gotten an update that that's been moved yet uh, back any further, but we'll, we're, we're awaiting them. The big freezers will hold uh, 400 vials, which would be about 4,000 doses each. All right. That's, a, that's another great topic that either, whichever comes sooner, a retreat or um, the next board meeting, Dr. Wright, I, I think that would be a really great topic to discuss. And Dr. Wright, I'm going to ask about the strategy for making vaccines available to the community. Yeah, that's yeah. Absolutely. Be glad that we have a whole outline on that. We'll be glad to share. Yeah, that's, that's important. That's what I hope we talk about. Great. All right. Anything else? Any other ask, Dr. Caldwell? And then we're going to move. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I did want to bring one more item to your attention, which is uh, World AIDS Day, December 1st, coming up. And I, I have uh, Tina Lester, who is just going to provide uh, some more information. Tina? Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, the um, EHE, which is ending the HIV epidemic group, is promoting Let's Talk About It, Know Your Status. And um, they will be having remembrance ac um, aspects of the day as usual. Um, and they will have a drive-through HIV testing. Um, the event will be from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and it will be shared widely via social media, flyers, direct outreach, partner outreach, and uh, it's because the numbers have been, um, the testing has been going down during COVID. And so they just want to bring it to um, the community's attention um, that testing is available. So it'll be a partnership of um, all the EHE membership. Um, and it will be here at the health department from nine to two on December 1st. All right, I'm gonna adjourn the meeting. Uh, I'm going to quickly open up the civil board meeting. Um, personnel changes are in our report. I would like everyone to take a peek at that. If there are any questions that anyone would like to address towards anyone, please do so now. Diane Harden. Uh, when did Diane leave? I mean, she was here for however many years, right? Yeah, she left 1030, 2020. Yeah, she left 1030. So, so um, I don't know, it's just such a startling thing when somebody's around for so long and all of a sudden, is she gone gone? No, I think she's still uh, participating with um, a relationship with us. And I'm sorry, I don't know who else. Would have been able to tell Anyone know anything about Ms. Hardin or we find out later? But, yeah. uh, she retired October 30th, but um, she probably will be back in a part-time position um, starting in December sometime to help out with the finance department. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Hearing none, meetings adjourned. Thank you all so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Be safe, everybody. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.